international science has confirmed what many of us felt. 2017 was one of the hottest years on record. And this continued into 2018, with Australia experiencing phenomenal heat waves at the same time as record high temperatures have been recorded in the Arctic. This is not just a blip. The 10 hottest years on record have been recorded since 1997. Quite simply, our planet is starting to cook. The Global Paris Agreement, signed by something in the order of 168 countries and including Australia, sets out a global framework to provide a strong response to this profound challenge of climate change. It sets out to, for, for signatory countries to keep global greenhouse gas emissions no higher than two degrees above pre-industrial levels. But the bad news is that here in Australia and internationally, we are already way off task in meeting this goal. And the recent withdrawal under President Trump of the United States poses even more challenges in this arena. There are a range of different responses in the context of the challenge of climate change. One of them that I want to talk about today is Gaia capitalism. In Greek mythology, Gaia refers to Mother Earth. Gaia capitalism then places an importance on putting an economic value on those activities that can store greenhouse gas emissions and essentially capture pollution that occurs in other parts of the world. Today, it's particularly carbon trading that I want to talk about, although, of course, Gaia capitalism is interested in all sorts of kinds of, of global trading in the world's natural resources, including water and air. But as I said, it's, it's carbon trading that I'm particularly interested to focus on and take you on a journey today. A number of heavy emitting industries and sectors, including the airline industries, banks, manufacturers and energy suppliers, have all become increasingly interested in global carbon trading initiatives. For those of you who might have ticked that box when you've taken a flight, for example, and who have been engaged in carbon offset, a part of trying to clean up the emissions associated with your flight, you've been directly engaged in the global carbon market. This, at face value, might seem like a good news story. But today, I want to ask two challenges, two questions. Firstly, I want to ask what might be some of the problems and challenges with focusing on this kind of, I think, relatively simple way of thinking about addressing the challenge of global climate change. And secondly, where do we think the burden of responsibility should lie to, to clean up the, the mess of, of, of global greenhouse gas emissions and to address the challenge of climate change. To do this, I want to talk specifically about plantation forestry for carbon offset, one of the more popular and well-known forms of global trading initiatives. Plantation forestry carbon offset works by calculating the volume of carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases that are stored in trees. This is then offset against emissions, as I said, often that take place in other parts of the world. What we find in looking, and, and certainly there are examples all around the world of projects that deliver all sorts of benefits associated with these projects, with these sorts of projects. And many of these projects are frequently described, including by governments and industries, as win-win approaches to addressing the challenge of climate change. That is, they provide pathways to sequester carbon and therefore address the challenge of, of greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere, as well as addressing deforestation and, and land clearing, while at the same time delivering social and economic benefits, including for vulnerable communities in, in different parts of the world. There's all sorts of examples of projects in many different parts of the world that show that planting trees as part of a plantation forestry 
carbon offset initiative provide social, economic and ecological benefits? Absolutely, we can look around the world and we can see many examples of this. But we can, and I argue we should, look around the world to see that there are also projects that present profound challenges, including for some of the most vulnerable communities on the planet. From Madagascar to Mozambique, from Cambodia to Cameroon, we see that sometimes there are adverse social consequences and economic consequences associated with these projects. We also see that at times, those that are most adversely affected by these projects are also those who are the least contributing to global greenhouse gas emissions. It's this inequality that invites us to think about where responsibility lies for addressing the burden of greenhouse gas emissions in the contemporary period. And it also asks us to look particularly to heavy emitting countries such as Australia as to what kind of responsibility we currently are taking and should take into the future to ensure that we reduce our global greenhouse gas emissions. So I want to now take you to a particular part of the world and to a particular project to explore some of these challenges. I want to take you to northern Uganda and as I said introduce you to one particular project. For some of you, you might be familiar with northern Uganda because of Joseph Kony and the Lord's Resistance Army. Some of you might remember international media in recent years that documented the damage, the social, the ecological, the economic violence inflicted in northern Uganda as a, con as a consequence of Kony and his army and the, the couple of decades of conflict that was driven in this area. It's this conflict combined with a range of complex national and international factors that leaves northern Ugandan communities and those living in this part of the world as some of the most vulnerable communities on the planet. And this is demonstrated, for example, in the high levels of income poverty with something like two thirds of this population experiencing income inequality and income poverty. Around half this population does not have access to safe drinking water. And this region of Uganda also lags behind other parts of Uganda in terms of access to education, health and other vital services to ensure a quality of life. It's here in this part of Uganda that Green Resources, a Norwegian owned and operated plantation, forestry and carbon offset company have come and introduced a plantation, forestry and carbon offset project. And so it's through some exploration of this particular case study that we can look at some of the challenges associated with relying upon carbon offset projects as a kind of panacea or magic bullet to address the challenge of climate change. Green resources have planted mostly a single kind of species of pine over just over 2,000 hectares of land in northern Uganda. Or to visualise that in another way, they've covered an area of around 3,700 football fields with, pine, with a monoculture, mostly monoculture, pine plantation. In so doing, this has shifted land use profoundly in this area. This was land that about 17 communities living in this area once relied upon to grow food, graze animals, and for access to water sources to fish. This has shifted significantly since the arrival of green resources and has created significant challenges for communities continuing to live in this area. Foremost amongst those challenges, and I really only want to focus on one today, but there are others that we could talk about, is the challenge of food security. As I said, the arrival of green resources has brought with it a profound shift in land use and land that once 
was, was a, a habitat that, that grew food, is now growing trees. And so this has, according to many members of local communities that I have spoken with over the last five years or so that I have conducted research in this area, as part of broader work I'm doing with a US-based think tank called the Oakland Institute, this shift in land use has essentially, as I said, as local communities describe, locked up land, land that was once used for vital subsistence activities. And this creates profound challenges in terms of feeding families. And this is an issue that particularly women in these communities talk about. So how are communities responded? What we have found over our years of research is that communities describe continuing to grow food on this land by cultivating crops, food crops, amongst the trees, the trees that green resources continue to grow here. This, many community members describe, is risky business because essentially what they are doing is illegal and community members described that their crops could be destroyed at any time. Similarly, for those community members who choose to graze animals amongst the trees, again, these can be confiscated at any time, community members describe. And the consequence of this is that a hefty fine is required to be paid in order to gain return access of those animals. For other community members, they talk about simply moving to other landscapes to grow food. And often those landscapes are poorer in terms of nutrients in the soil. We see communities describing that they now grow food further distances from where they live, which takes more time to walk to. But at the same time, they are growing food on rocky outcrops and street, steep slopes. And these are not landscapes that produce high volumes of food. So in short, what we see is an acute food crisis and a food crisis that is growing in the context of the arrival and the continued existence of green resources in this northern Ugandan site. Many women, for example, in a most profound example of this crisis, talk about preparing just one meal a day for their families as a way of coping with these food shortages. Despite these challenges, associated with green resources conduct in northern Uganda, it has been engaged in a carbon trading arrangement for some years. The Swedish Energy Agency, which is the energy provider through the Swedish government, has purchased carbon credits directly from this northern Ugandan project. And it has done this as part of its attempts to comply with the commitments it's made under that Paris Climate Agreement to reduce global greenhouse gases. Yet in light of growing international understandings of some of the challenges of this project, including the challenges related to food security, in 2015, the Swedish government, through the Swedish Energy Agency, suspended payment to green resources. In response, this one particular company has undertaken a couple of reforms in its northern Ugandan project and with communities impacted by green resources existence in northern Uganda. And yet this suspension remains. So what we can see from this northern Ugandan site is that the future of this company here is uncertain, but so too is the future for these communities. So what I've done here today is tell you the story of just one plantation forestry and carbon offset project. And it's a story that we can take lessons from. What we can see from this story is the absolute incompatibility between on the one hand growing trees and the vital needs of local communities to have access to land to grow food particularly when we understand that these are communities that rely upon land to engage in subsistence activities that are vital for life and livelihoods. What we see, simply put, is an incompatibility between land uses. But more broadly, what we can take from this is that despite the hopes of those that might champion gayer capitalism, that there may be a magic bullet to address the challenge of climate change, in the form of carbon trading, including plantation forestry, it's far from that simple. 
Carbon markets may, into the future, play a role in terms of addressing this phenomenal challenge of climate change that we face, but only if they centre the rights of local people. As I said at the start of this talk, often those who have made the least contribution in terms of global greenhouse gas emissions. So, next time you tick that box to offset your emissions associated with flying or any other kinds of offset initiatives that you're engaged with because of the nature of the modern lifestyles that we have and the kinds of emissions that are simply associated with being alive in the 21st century. Remember, it's not that simple. And addressing the challenge, the challenge of climate change will require more complex and more sensitive to social justice needs um, than simply a simple, simple box solution. And so it's with that in mind that I leave you with the thought that perhaps it's through our everyday lives and the everyday ways that we can reduce our global greenhouse gas emissions that hope might lie. But also, just as importantly, matched with sustaining the pressure upon governments and industry to ensure that they take a leading role in ensuring the transition to a just and sustainable low energy future. Thank you.